Thank you for downloading this podcast from Emmanuel Church Lurgan. At Emmanuel, our vision is to help rewrite the story of Craig Avon, Ireland and the nations with the good news of the Kingdom of God. We hope you enjoy listening to this message. And we're continuing on. This is number seven on our theme of listen. And uh, we're, I suppose, concentrating that around the whole idea that it is so, so important at this moment in time to listen to the voice of God. Actually, I think there's never been a time as um, poignant to listen to God as it is now across the church. The church is changing. The world is changing. Um, We're living in a different day. um, And God is speaking again. And I think we need to be very, very wise around that as not just church leaders, but as individuals in our communities as well. And we built this around the, that little verse, he that is ears to hear, let him hear, which is four times in the New Testament like that, and then seven times in Revelation, the little bits added at the end. You know, he that ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. So four times like that, and seven times, <clears throat> one to each of the churches in Revelation 2 and 3 that we've been looking at. One of the verses that has been really important to my journey over the last, I suppose, 25 and maybe even 30 years is this verse here in Deuteronomy 2. It's a verse that the Lord spoke to me personally um, in a time of, of, of fasting and praying. Um, uh, Jill was alive at the time, and her and I had went away to, to, to fast for three days and three nights around the, where we should go as a church. We were very, very young. We were just about a year, or maybe a year and a half old at the time, and we were contemplating what we should do. We had never really planned to plant a church. We just started to help really broken people, and then all of a sudden things began to happen. We began to realize that God was speaking, and uh, it was the end of the third day of the fast, because it's always the answer usually always comes at the end of a fast. I, I hate how that works, but it's usually the way it works, all right? And I'm the worst faster in the world. I think you should call it slowing, not fasting. But um, and, and can I say that I, I do think there's something very significant. I know for me personally, I feel the Lord is pulling me into something over the next 21 days. Now, I know that could be very personal to me, um, but I'm just sharing it as a leader, as a pastor in the church, just that... I feel there's something very significant over the next 21 days that God really wants to say to the church, not just to our church, but the church across the nation. And I feel that there's something God pulling leaders into. I've been talking to a few leaders over the last number of days about just a spiritual detox, just really getting into the place to listen afresh to the voice of God. So the message that I'm going to speak this morning is sort of based on that premise of what the Lord has been saying to me personally around this. And in this verse, you can see the significance of it. That the, Let me just read it. It says, Then we turned and journeyed into the wilderness in the direction of the Red Sea, as the Lord told me. So they were doing exactly what the Lord had said. The Lord had told them to do this. For many days we traveled around Mount Seir. And then this is a little phrase that caught me back um, almost 30 years ago. Then the Lord said to me, so there's another voice, there was a second calling, there was a change of direction, there was a, we can't just always go on the first note, there's, there's, we've got to have ears to hear, we've got to listen because God can redirect your steps and, and so that's why it's important to have that daily relationship with the Lord. Then the Lord said to me, you've been traveling, you've been doing this long enough, what I've told you to do, you've been doing it now long enough. It's time to change direction, and um, you'll find there northward. For us, it was very significant because our home faced east, and north was Lurgan. And so we lived in Warringstown at the time, and we knew and we felt for a long time that God was calling us to plant somewhere in Lurgan. And so that was very significant for us. And there was loads more in that passage. Um, And we can see the fact from this fact that God continues to speak. God speaks all the time. I, and in my daily devotionals, if you're following them, you'll know that I pray that prayer every morning. Speak, Lord, for your sons and your daughters are listening. And so we've got to have ears that hear at this moment in time. And he told them to journey. But now there was a new season. There was a fresh word. There was something fresh to hear from the Lord. And so I feel something in the next 21 days. I do feel that very significantly. Again, I'm personalizing that and if you want to contribute in that and do something, do it. But I feel personally for me, that's what the Lord 
has sent. And so my question to you this morning is, do you know his voice? Are you listening? Have you heard his voice? Have have you created enough space and enough time to listen? Because that's really important. This little plaque. I'm sorry for the wonky photograph, but it hangs straight across from my desk where I sit in my study. It faces me, and so I just took it from my seat. Didn't calculate it too well, but I just took it from where I was sitting. Um, And and it says, let's be still so that we may hear the whisper of God. And so there's something about the still, small voice of God that I think we need to really be listening to. So there's something, and I think... I actually think there's a work that needs to be done in that. It's very disciplined. It's something that doesn't come easy. I'm not going to sell it to you short. I'm not going to sell it to you. That's an easy thing to do. It's not easy to to shut out the clamor of the world. It's not easy to shut out all the other voices. They're all coming, and there's a million voices at the moment. And so there's there, there's there's it's something to to it takes work to smother all the other stuff, and really focusing here on God. I love what Dale Carnegie said. He puts it this way. He says, most of the important things in the world have been accomplished by people who have kept on trying when there seemed to be no hope at all. And so we have to keep on trying. We have to work at this. It's the work of the spirit that we have to to do. Um, There's a story. I've shared it before. This guy here, Thomas Carlyle, who was a uh, a British historian. He was a writer, an essayist. He was a, a translator and a philosopher and a mathematician, and he was a teacher. And in the 1800s, he he um, he wrote a, a a document on the history of the French Revolution. Now, it wasn't just a, an ordinary document. He wrote this by hand. There was no computers or typewriters, and it took him three years to do the work. Three full years. And it was a 1,500-page manuscript. And he gave it to his friend, John Stuart Mills, to edit and proofread. And Mills set it in a basket by his fireside to work on in the evenings when he sat by the fire. Now, you know what's coming next, don't you? While John Stuart Mills was on a trip, his maid saw the stack of paper and used it as fire lighters um, and, and, and while he was away. And when Carlyle heard this, when he came back and heard this, he fell into deep depression, as you would, three years' work up in smoke. And so he went into sort of like a deep depression, and for three weeks, they say, he never actually left his house. He was so depressed. But where he was sitting at a window, um, he noticed a laborer across the road working on an old broken-down wall. And for the three weeks that he was sitting depressed, he watched this laborer rebuild and reconstruct this broken-down wall. And the little light come on in his head. He watched this laborer do this brick by brick, eight hours, eight or ten hours every day for 21 days. And he had this idea, and he thought, well, if he can build that wall brick by brick, I can do mine page by page. And that's exactly what he did. And after two years, he did it down two years, completing what today is we have a a classic um, piece of historical literature. And here's my point. If you've lost something valuable, if there's something valuable, you may have to start over again. I've had to do that many times in my life where you have to start over again. And you need to, in a way, I think, begin with your original calling. And I think that God is pulling us back. I feel he's pulling the church back. I feel he's pulling us back to the original calling of our hearts. And and when you get back to that original calling in your life, then what you do is you have the compass to move forward. Because God is the God of the compass points. He's not, he doesn't give us a map. I wish he did sometimes. He doesn't do that. He gives us compass points and he points us in the right direction. And so that's why our values in Emmanuel have been our core themes of, that define the DNA of our family culture and the underlying beliefs that shape um, who we are and drive our behaviors. And so in the early days of our church community, we coined these little phrases. It used to be loving God, loving people based on the great commandment and the great commission. And then we added that simple little phrase, um, loving the world. And then what we did is we tried to define a culture around that. These were our values. And so we found ourselves being sold out in a passionate pursuit for the presence of God, it became our number one thing that we would prioritize the presence of God with an extravagant love for the hurting and the broken 
in our community. And the result of that is that it would extend even out into our mission fields and out into the, the world. And so we wanted the result of that, that every single person in our church would be able to hear the voice of God. That was the whole reason of that and determine what to do with their lives and what God was looking to teach them. So what I want to talk to you about this morning is this big question, how do I become alive in my spirit and hear the voice of God afresh? How does that happen? How, how can I make that happen? If we're going to go on a journey for 21 days, you're going to join me in that, that would be good fun. Um, and I think when it comes to those, that big question, I think there are probably four things that personally I've been challenging myself with um, this week. And number one is uh, my personal relationship with God. Not your relationship with church, all right? But your relationship with God. Are you born again? And maybe you are born again and you don't feel any different. And my prayer is that you will, this, this time that you will have a powerful encounter with the power of God, with the living God, your God. And I want to make it something that excites you and that you will share with others around you like we heard the stories of the life groups there. Secondly, the, the second thing is that you experience, uh, what is your experience of God's supernatural Power. What is the, the, the experience of God's power in supernatural proportions? What are you experiencing at the moment? Is there anything you're, you feel you're missing? Is there anything you feel you could be deeper in? Because we need a deposit of God that's beyond us. Like, like if God's calling us to do something as a church, like a thousand people, it's, it's got to... It's got to be beyond us. It's got to be something that if God doesn't turn up, it's not going to happen. If God doesn't turn up, we're going to be in trouble. All right? The third thing is the fresh encounter with the Holy Spirit. One that will increase your hunger and your appetite for God. One that will, that, that if your appetite maybe at this moment in time is not good for spiritual things, that maybe you need that fresh encounter. And I'm praying for you and I'm praying for all of our church and I'm praying for me at the minute for a fresh new appetite. And then this one is the breaking of all limitations that would hold you back. And that's a biggie. All right. There are so many. Um, I don't know if ever you've been to a car boot sale or a garage sale. Sometimes the Americans have garage sales. We do car boot sales. And, and usually people do car boot sales because they've collected so much stuff. They don't know what to do with it. Someone once said that Northern Ireland is the only place that you pay a 25 or 30,000 pound for a car and park it in the drive and put junk in your garage. And it's kind of true, isn't it? That's what we do. That's what we do. And, and, and so there's so much stuff. And maybe you need to get a spiritual car boot sale because um, so much stuff gathers. And when so much stuff gathers, I think it limits our heart. And uh, so what I want to do for a few minutes, I want to take a look at King Asa. Now, King Asa was one of the 19 kings of um, Judah. There was no good kings in Israel at all. Remember when the kingdoms divided? There was no good kings in Israel at all. And out of the 19 um, kings of Judah, there was only eight of them were good. And Asa was one of those kings. And um, he, he stepped out to be good. And maybe this morning the challenge is, what, could it, what, what would it take for us to step out to be good? What would it be to, to help us to step out of that swamp or that wilderness experience that maybe you find yourself in at the minute? Now, we'll look at the, the passages as we go along, all right? Um, in 2 Chronicles 14, I think I have 1 Chronicles up there, but it's not 1 Chronicles, sorry, it's 2 Chronicles, my mistake. It's 2 Chronicles 14. He did what was right in the eyes of of the Lord. I love that. That's simple, yet it's profound. And if you do what is good and right in the eyes of the Lord, he will respond to that. That's the beauty of that. Here's what he done. It says that he, he pulled down, he, he took away, he pulled down the high places and foreign altars. Every time God moves in the life of a church, Every time God moves in the life of an individual, it is in response to something been pulled down. Every single time. There is no move of God without removal. 
And there is no move of God without repentance. We can't get salvation without repentance. And we can't get the fullness of God without removing some things. And so if the Holy Spirit were to step into my life, into your life right now, the question is, what would he remove? What's your high place? What is it? Notice he broke down some stuff. And you need to become aggressive in your life. And I feel as we move into this season, God is definitely on the move at the minute. The church, as I say, is changing. The world is changing. It looks like the scene has been set for the return of our Lord. And so these are difficult messages. They're not tickling your ears. And I don't want to do that, nor does Dave. We want to challenge our own hearts and your hearts because we need to become aggressive in our lives right now, I think. And the Holy Spirit will not continually dwell with junk. You need to know that. He's gracious and he's patient, but we will grieve him if when he points it out, we don't deal with it. And there's a verse in the Bible in 1 Thessalonians 5.19, talks about not quenching the spirit. And I think it's one of the key scriptures for believers in the Bible, not to quench the spirit. How do you quench the spirit? Well, when he starts to reveal stuff to you and you ignore him, eventually you quench the spirit. It's a, it's, a, it's a very powerful verse. Here's what happens. Let's continue with Asa. He, he, uh, he commanded the nation, Judah, to seek the Lord. Incredible, isn't it? He commanded the whole nation to seek the Lord. And then it tells us that he also took out all the cities of Judah and the high places and the incense altars. This guy is getting pretty aggressive. I like him. I like him a lot. Then it, it tells us here that verses 6 and 7, he built new places. Notice the last phrase at the bottom of, of the passage there. They built and prospered. Something began to happen here. The, 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 there's a movement. He's pulling a nation together, and something's beginning to happen. When you jump on to verse 8, you'll find that, that Asa built an army of thousands and thousands of people. What an amazing army. Do you think we could do it? Do you think we could get a thousand new people to, to, to follow God in Craig Evan? I, I think we could. I think we could. And there's something about this call of this man, this cleansing, this removing, that starts to attract people. People are drawn to the call. Now let's jump on. In verse 9 and 10, the Ethiopians came against them with a million men. They reckon that a million men. Have you any idea what that must have looked at coming towards you? Scary stuff. Asa had half that number. And verse 10 says, Asa leads his army out against him. And then he prays what I think is one of the most incredible prayers that the Bible records. Let's read his prayer. Where do you see his prayer? It says, then Asa called to the Lord his God and said, Lord, there is no one like you to help the powerless against the mighty. Help us, Lord our God, for we rely on you. And in your name, we have come against this vast army. Lord, you are our God. Do not let mere mortals prevail against you. What a prayer. Whether we are mighty or few, he says, I'm resting on you. That's 11 references to God in 58 words. I counted them. 11 references to God in 58 words. It's a ratio about um, five, one, one mention of God in every five words. It's pretty incredible. And verse 12 says that the Lord defeated the Ethiopians. And the authorized says he struck them. I love that. I love that. He struck them. And then what happened was there was an incredible prophecy. Let me read it to you out of my new Bible. Got a new Bible. Do you like it? An early birthday present. And um, if you ask me what I want for my birthday, it's always a Bible. So uh, um, let me... Let me break it in here, all right? I'm just showing off now. Um, I, I want to read the first seven verses, all right? And if you, just, just, just listen to this, all right? The Spirit of the Lord came on Azariah, the son of Oded, and he went out to meet Asa. This is a prophet. And he said to him, listen to me, Asa. Listen, listen to me. And all Judah and Benjamin, the Lord is with you when you're with him. Pretty awesome, isn't it? The Lord is with you when you're with him. You know that little verse in James says, you draw near unto God, he will draw near unto you. The Lord is with you when you're with him. If you seek him, he'll be found by you. But if you forsake him, he'll forsake you. For a long time Israel was without a true God, without a priest to teach and without the law. But in their distress, they turned to the Lord, the God of Israel, and sought him and he was found by them. In those days, it was not safe to travel about for all the inhabitants of the land were in great turmoil. One nation was being crushed by another. 
one city by another. Sound familiar? Because God was troubling them with every kind of distress. But as for you, be strong and do not give up, for your work will be rewarded. Pretty awesome. That's a pretty awesome um, passage of Scripture. Now, let's look at what happens when, when that happened. Verse 8 of the next chapter, all right, of chapter 15 of Second Chronicles. When Asa heard these words, when he heard these words and the prophecy of Azariah, son of Oded, the prophet, he took courage and he, he, he done another step. He, he moved again. He removed the detestable idols from the whole land of Judah and Benjamin from the towns he had captured in the hills of Ephraim. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was in front of the portico of the Lord's temple. He removed. He cut down. But here he listened. He's listening to the voice of God. And our future in God is listening. Our future in God is hearing his voice. It says he took courage. His spirit was absorbing the word. He began to rid the land of more stuff. When was the last time you heard the voice of God? When was the last time you sat down to really listen? When you go on in, in, the, in verse 9 of that chapter 15, it says he gathered all the people. Verse 12 says he entered with the people into a covenant to seek the Lord. I love that. With all their heart and their soul. Verse 15 says they sought God with all their heart and soul and God gave them rest. Let me tell you what happened here. God moved and then the heart of Asa was awakened. And with an awakened heart, my definition of an awakened heart is this. It's a heart, uh, an awakened heart is one that has been shaken by the Holy Spirit into a new awareness of God's presence and a new desire for that spiritual presence. Other kings didn't have uh, this, they didn't awake like Asa did, but he vowed to destroy all the high places in the land. And he even ventured into Israel. If you read the history of it, it's very powerful. He even ventured into Israel and messed with some of their high places. And the story tells us that a great multitude actually left Israel and followed this man, Asa, because of his courage and because of his heart for God. He is a man of courage that shook things up. What about us? What about you? Would you take courage to... To step into your life and sort out some stuff. Anything that has a focus in your life that's higher than God is a high place. Let me say it again. Anything that has a focus higher than God in your life is a high place. And you've got to get rid of it. You've got to get rid of it. Anything that is impure, anything that dilutes you for God. There's loads of stuff that I just feel at the minute dilutes my spirit. And I just feel... For me, the next 21 days, that's my detox. Just the stuff, some of the, some of the box sets that we watch, some of the, you know, I'm not trying to get all religious on it, just some stuff that I feel that dilutes our hearts, that we just need to, need to get our hearts aligned with God. And you need to say to your heart, awaken Holy Spirit, awaken in me, and push me to do what is right. Because you see, an awakened heart is a voice. You say, Phil, where do you get that from? Well, here it says, the psalmist would say, my heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, will I seek your heart. An awakened heart begins to speak to you. An awakened heart begins to challenge some of the things that you do and say. And so my question to you, is your heart speaking to you at the minute? Because if it doesn't, maybe, maybe it's just dead or maybe it's bound or shackled by other things and it can't talk to you anymore. And we need to release it from bondage and allow it to begin to speak. So Asa had a heart that was liberated, was speaking to him. And his heart said, yes. I will do what the prophet says. I will seek the Lord with everything that's in me. He's going along with the psalmist in 62. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. When was the last time you just poured out your heart to God like that? When was the Oh, that our hearts would just come alive again. Oh, that our hearts would begin to beat again with the spirit, the thrust of the Holy Spirit. And it all starts in our hearts. And I'm asking you to become accountable to God and require, that requires you to value him above everything else in your life and above everybody else in your life. That's why Jesus told the disciples in Matthew 22 in the great commandment that you should love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. 
God wasn't asking for a piece. He was asking for everything. He wasn't asking for little. He was asking for a lot. It's a big call. It's a big step. Yes, it is. And, um, and there's something about ha- that happens in this because, the, again, the prophet Jeremiah said, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. And so to seek is to value what you go after. And so what I'd say to you this morning, just my little list to you this morning is this. Do you, do you value a clean heart? Well, then go after it. Do you value a pure conscience? Go after it. Do you value a deeper prayer life? Go after it. Do you value a deeper walk with God? Then go after it. Do you value an encounter with God that will redirect and will soften your heart towards him? Well, go after it. You say, Phil, how do I do it? How do I do it? Well, just do what they did. Asa made a covenant to the Lord. Just make a, co- a fresh covenant to God. How about it? How about making a fresh covenant to God for the next 21 days? You're going to seek him with all of your heart. You're going to move some stuff out of the road. You're going to fast some stuff that, that dilutes and, 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 and gets in the way of your focus. And just over the next 21 days as we close into Christmas, that we just focus our hearts on the Lord. Would you make a covenant to revive your devotions? Would you make a covenant that instead of giving him 15 minutes, you'd give him 30? Would you make a covenant to, to, to redefine and re-employ and re-navigate um, your, your, your daily disciplines and your prayer life? To dump out all the rubbish and to grab hold of God and to say, these are the best days of my life. Because there's something about um, understanding, even accountability, even in the life groups where you could begin to challenge each other over the next 21 days. Because here's the, here's the thing that I think at the moment, it's time to seek God seriously and it's time to seek God persistently. And the, the prophet Hosea put it this way. I love this little verse. So for yourselves righteousness, reap steadfast love. Isn't that beautiful? Break up the fallow ground. For it is time to seek the Lord that he may come and reign righteousness upon you. You know what? As I read these passages at the moment, I just think these passages were written for now. I know they were written for then, but I just feel these passages at the moment are written for now. I just feel that the fallow ground is plowed ground that has become hard again. It's ground that's been plowed and left too long. So when the farmer plows the ground, he has to work at it. I'm not dead sure what you do next after you plow it. I'm not a farmer. But... But plowed ground that's just left just gets hard again. And then you just have to go back and replow it. That's what followed ground is. And then Matthew 7, 7 in the Sermon on the Mount, we're told to ask and seek and knock and be persistent. When Jesus told the parable of the persistent widow in Luke 18, he said, men ought always to pray and never lose heart. Don't lose heart at the minute. Don't lose heart with the the power of the evening news. Don't lose heart with what's happening in the world. Understand timing and delay. God's suddenlies are always built upon graduals. I've told you this time and time again. And I've never saw a suddenly that wasn't prefixed by a gradual. It's a divine law and it's an established principle in the Bible. And the opposite is also true. And you see something that happens, you begin to realize, oh, how you go back and you, you trace. I've only got to watch stuff that's going on in the news around some of the, the sex scams and stuff that are going on in the moment with Prince Andrew and Harvey Weinstein and all of them people. I can't even remember all their names. But you begin to see when the, when the, when the suddenly happens, you begin to realize, oh, all right, all of this was going on. And so it's the same. Oh, that we, we'd cry with the prophet Isaiah and say, God, oh, that you would rend heaven and come down. Now, I'm sorry as the brethren boy and me, I, I often say you can do this in seven hours. Seven hours. Here they are. Right? You just need to pray the impossible is re-envisioned. You need to pray all spiritual deadwood is removed. You need to pray that all spiritual passions are restored. You need to pray that all spiritual attack will be resisted. This is a prayer thing for you for the next 21 days. Pray that all people groups will be reached. Pray for unexpected miracles to be received. And pray that your prayers will be rewarded when you wait on the Lord. Let's invite him in. Let's invite him in. Let's grab onto our inheritance. This is our time. This is our day. Commitments to a preferred future do not come randomly. They are intentionally established at times when you're thinking clearly and you're close to God. Yes, dreams can come true. 
I finish with the story of Joshua Parman. He's renowned to be one of the world's best violinists of her day. Crowds flock from around the world to hear him play. When he was 12, he was struck by polio and he now uses crutches and leg braces to get around and he's always the last one to get his seat on stage with the orchestra. Here's the story. He was playing in the Lincoln Center in New York, a very difficult piece, and he was about 90 seconds in when a loud twang of a string breaking could be heard right to the back of the hall. The orchestra played softly to cover and everyone wondered what was going to happen now. Protocol would allow the lead violinist to go off stage and restring and retune his violin, but Parman <clears throat> had sat down and taken off his leg braces so he didn't have that um, privilege. So according to the Boston Globe, Mr. Parman waved the orchestra on and instantly transposed the music to three strings instead of four and played the piece flawlessly. When he got to the end, there was a stunned silence. And then the audience stood and roared in applause. And then the orchestra stood up and started banging their instruments on the floor in applause and honor to Parman. And here's my point. Mr. Parman, with a busted string and two busted legs, a guy who probably told, was told he could never do it, said this when he was interviewed. He said, all of my life, it's been my mission to make music with that which remains. All of my life, it has been my mission to make music with that which remains. God says today, what's left? 62 and three weeks. I know I don't look it. But 62 and three weeks, God saying, will you give me what's left? Will you give me what remains? Would you be willing today to say, God, I'll give you what's left. I don't know what's left in my life, but God, whatever it is, I'll give it to you. That's your mission. That's how you will become fully alive to God. That's how you'll begin to hear his voice. Let's pray. Dave's going to come up and direct us then. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, may you challenge our hearts today to give us and to give you what remains, whatever's left of our life here on earth, that we could say, God, it's yours. It's fully, undeniably, totally, absolutely yours. So God, may that be our challenge of our hearts today. In Jesus' name. We hope you enjoyed listening to this podcast. For more information about our church and all that we do, please visit our website at emmanuel-church.co.uk